Let's get to it. So I'm going to start talking about probability in Barnard spaces, which is going to excite all of the probabilists and, and scare everybody else. But I will just warn everybody in advance. Well, this is kind of a reverse warning. We're not going to do anything really difficult with probability. We're not going to do any serious probability theory. We're just going to use sort of basics or basics plus epsilon and then put that in the setting of Barnack spaces. And the difficulty will all be Barnack space difficulty rather than probability difficulty. So if you don't have a background in probability, this is okay. I didn't have any probability background when I started working on this and it was a bit of a struggle, but it, it worked. Um, on the other hand, of course, if you do know probability, then a lot of this will be very easy for you. Of course, until the Barnack spaces come in and then there's gonna be some new interesting things that come up. But yeah, I'm not going to assume that you know any probability, but yeah, if you do, good. So probability in Barnack spaces, what are we going to actually look at? I'm just going to introduce some fundamental concepts. For example, random variables. Uh, conditional expectations. And most importantly, martingales. And martingales are probably the most advanced probabilistic thing we'll use. Just looking at my notes here, as I said, we're not going to use any heavy theory. And I should say all of this is in the Barnack valued setting. And why are we going to do this? It's a good question. This is a course about analysis in Barnack spaces or Barnack valued analysis. The reason is that the, the fundamental assumptions on Barnack spaces that we need are probabilistic. Basically, probability is really at a deep level underlying everything we need to do. Probability is secretly underlying a lot of harmonic analysis, even though when you do scalar valued harmonic analysis, you don't necessarily see any probability, it's there. There's always alternative ways of doing things with probability. And sometimes these give you some deep insights in the scalar valued setting. And in the Barnack valued setting, not only does it give you insights, sometimes it's the only way to proceed. The lack of orthogonality that you have or that you don't have by not working with Hilbert spaces ends up being replaced by probabilistic orthogonality in some sense. And I should really write that. Rather than using orthogonality, you use probabilistic orthogonality. And I guess I should also have orthogonality in quotes there too, because it's not true orthogonality that we're going to use. It's just something like it. Key example, of course, of a fundamental assumption we're going to make is the UMD property that I introduced very briefly in lecture one, this unconditionality of martingale differences. And you see there's martingale in the, in the title there. You're going to need probability to analyze this property properly. Okay, so let's start the, the proper part of the lecture. Um, all of probability is really just influenced by gambling. So we're going to do a bit of that gambling in Barnack spaces. If you've read the notes, you know what I'm gonna talk about here. We're gonna play a game. I have a coin. It's a two Euro coin. And the problem with Euro coins is that they don't have a head of the queen on them. So it's not really clear what's head and what's heads and what's tails. So I need to think, okay, one side says two, let's call that tails. The other side's got an eagle on it because I'm in Germany. Let's call that the head. The eagle's got a head. So we're going to fix a Barnack space X. <laughs> and you can think of any Barnack space you like here. But for this example, I'm going to take X to be the continuous functions on the closed unit interval with the supremum norm, because every continuous function on a compact space has a supremum, has a maximum and attains it. We have our, our wallet, which is represented by a vector s. At the moment, it's s to the minus one because we haven't started the game yet. 
we start with nothing. So it's the zero vector in the Banach space X or the, the zero function. So if this is the unit interval, this is the current state of our wallet. You're not gonna be able to buy anything with this money in our wallet. It's just a hypothetical wallet. So what we would need to do is we need to pick a vector x0 in x. And this is gonna be the vector that we bet. This is our wager. It doesn't matter that we don't have it in our wallet. We can go into debt, we can take loans or whatever. So you pick any vector you like. Does anybody want to volunteer a vector <laughs> in this space? <laughs> it's a bit hard to volunteer a function, right? I'm gonna volunteer a function to start us off. I'm gonna pick this function. Uh, it's sort of like sine, I guess. This here is x zero that we take. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna flip the coin. And if I get heads, the, the eagle on the two euro coin, if I get heads, we win this vector. So we add the vector to our wallet. So if heads, the state of our wallet at time zero, is currently time zero, will be the state of our wallet at time, at the previous time, plus the vector that we bet. But if we lose, if we get tails, then we subtract that vector. So we, we lose our bet in a sense. So what have we got? I'm gonna flip the coin. We got heads. So our wallet is currently in this state. Cool. And we're gonna keep doing that infinitely many times because we have a lot of time on our hands here in lockdown. So we can pick another vector to bet. And a key point here is that we know the state of the wallet S0 at this point. We didn't have to decide the first vector before the, all of the previous stuff happened, right? You, you repeat the game over and over again. So let's pick another vector. Anybody want to volunteer a vector? <laughs> identity function? The identity function, f of x equals x. Or the constant function or the identity function? Identity function. That's not gonna be continuous. Oh no, it is, what am I saying? I'm, I'm an idiot. I'm thinking of periodizing it. Yeah, that's gonna be continuous, yeah. So we've got zero, one. Let's take this function. F x one, well, f of x equals x. Let's say f of t equals t so that we don't confuse ourselves with x's. So this is our x one. We flip the coin and this time I've got tails. So before I've got heads, now I've got tails. So now we're gonna lose this function. So now I have to draw what we've got and I'm not so good at this. We're taking the s, <laughs> s zero minus x one. So what is it? It's zero here. It's one here. It's the identity function. Uh, no, we take, we have to lose the identity function because we lost the last one. So it's gonna be minus one here. So it's this sign type thing minus the identity. So it's gonna look sort of like that, right? That's a really bad drawing. Sort of like that. Is that even a function? Yeah. Does this look plausible? This is now the state of our wallet. I'm not gonna continue this because it's gonna get embarrassing to try to add these graphs together. And this is high school stuff, but I haven't been in high school for a while, but you get the point of this game. And we keep doing this for all natural numbers N. We have our wallet at time N plus one. It's given by the state of the wallet at the previous time, plus or minus, depending on the outcome of the coin toss, the bet, at time n plus one. And this is some sort of Barnack space gambling game. And you should ask, how do you win this game? <laughs> uh, you don't. There's no real sense of winning here. There's no sense of having a positive wallet in general. In this case, because we took the Barnack space X to be continuous functions on into R, for example, on the unit interval, we have an order on this Barnack space. We can talk about a function being positive or negative or whatever. 
So you could make your goal to, to make the function as large as possible, for example, or just to stay positive or something like that. But in a general Barnard space, you don't have this order. So this isn't really a, a game that you win or lose. It's just a process, All right? It's a stochastic process. And in a sense, this game's fair. So let's suppose you're at time n and the state of your wallet is Sn. What's the expected outcome of the next trial? What's is in probabilistic language? What is the expected value of Sn plus one? I mean, we're gonna bet Xn plus one. The expected value of Sn plus one, given where we're at now, given Sn, we're either gonna win a vector the vector xn plus one, or we're going to lose it. And if we average out, these happen with equal probability because we're flipping a coin. So if we average these out, the result doesn't change. And this is saying that the expected value of sn plus one given sn is sn. So the current state of the wallet is already the best guess in a sense. So it's the expected value of what's going to happen at the next stage. So what this is saying ultimately is that sn is a martingale That's what it means for a stochastic process to be a martingale. It means that it is a, it's representing a fair game in a sense. You don't have any strategy that will let you win or make you lose or anything like that. It's a balanced game. Of course, there's no winning or losing, but you have a sense of balance here. We're gonna define all these things properly later on. I just wanted to start by giving a bit of a feel for what this concept actually means. Martingales are balanced games in a sense. And you can do all of this in Barnack spaces, of course. All of this was happening in a Barnack space. I mean, it's familiar to do this over R if you've done stochastic processes before, but you can do this very generally. Are there any questions about that game? Does anybody want to play the game more? No. <laughs> it's contrived enough as it is. Oh, I've got some notes here. I forgot to say a couple of things. So just to link all of the concepts we're going to learn with this game, the game is modeled by a stochastic process. Simple enough, okay. The game is modeled by a stochastic process. SN is a martingale and I've already said that. Um, the information at time N in the abstract is modeled by a filtration, which I'll introduce in this lecture. It's gonna be a collection of sigma algebras that are increasing, that are representing the information you have at time n. Uh, what else? So the wallet, Sn, which is a martingale, not only is it a martingale, it's a martingale transform, whatever that is. It's a martingale transform of the coin flip process. So the stochastic process you get by looking at the sequence of heads and tails that come out of the coin flips. The wallet function is a, the wallet process is a martingale transform of that martingale with coefficients given by Xn, the process of bets that we make at the end of time. So in some sense, you can combine the coin flip process and the, the bet process and get the wallet process. This is clear from the, from the definition of Sn plus one up here. This plus minus is given by the coin flip process. You've got these coefficients here, this Xn plus one, and you can recover the wallet from that. So this is what's called a martingale transform. And I'll define those later on as well. And they're important in our theory. And this process, the coin, um, the, the betting process, the things that you bet, this is called predictable. This is a predictable process. Predictable meaning that you don't need to see in the future to be able to place your bets. You only need to be able to see into the past, which is matches our ideas of, of causality, basically. You're not looking in the future, you can see the past. Yeah. So when we call this 
predictable? Yeah. Do we say that basically they're we're not choosing them, but they're kind of given to us? Oh, we're answer. choosing them, but they only depend on the information that we already have. So they're not given in advance, but they are given as a function of what's known at that time. So in our game, we, we did the first coin flip and then we decided on the second bet. And then we did the second coin flip and then we decided on the third bet. And the third bet is allowed to depend on the outcomes of the first and second coin flips, but not on the third. So, so basically we have to choose them in a predictable way because we can include information in our choice that we do not have, right? Exactly. Okay. And when you encode information in the appropriate way through a filtration, then a predictability is going to correspond to measurability with respect to the filtration of some certain function. It's, it's, it's expressed by the conditional expectations, right? Not to jump ahead, but... Yeah, it is jumping ahead, but yes. But we'll get to that in this lecture, yeah. yeah. All of this I'm going to make rigorous, but the idea is, is just we have this sort of game. We're allowed to make bets depending on the past, but not on the future, which makes sense. So that's the, the game, the, the quick introduction to probability in Barnack spaces. And now let's move on to some actual math. Let's make a definition. Let's take a probability space. So a probability space is a measure space that's got measure one. Just to make that clear, it's a measure space and the measure of the whole space is one. If you haven't done measure theoretic probability before, it's not so hard. And we take a Barnack space X. So an X valued random variable Next valid random variable is a strongly measurable function. F from omega into X. And I want to underline here strongly measurable. If you've done probability, you think, yeah, a random variable is a function on the probability space. We're going to demand strong measurability here because that's going to make all the theory work out properly. And of course, by Pettis, if X is not separable, then this is actually a, a sort of strong condition on the function. But if X is separable, this is just measurability. Uh, okay, so if a random variable, I'll write them as just RV. So if we have a random variable, which is integrable, because I didn't assume integrability, I just assumed strong measurability. If your random variable is integrable, we define the expectation. This expectation, we write it as E of F, expected value or mean, if you like to think in that way, is just the integral of F over the probability space. And this is in X because it's a Bochner integral. So these are all, this is just a classic probabilistic definition, but when you do it in Barnack spaces, your integrals have to be Bochner integrals. And for that Bochner integral to make sense, you need your random variable to be strongly measurable and integrable. Having it just be, be integrable in the sense of having an L1 norm function isn't enough to make the Bochner integral exist. We needed approximation with simple functions to get that. And that's strong measurability. So that's what a random variable is. That's nice and simple. If you don't like probability, every time you hear random variable, think measurable function, a strongly measurable function, but you should like probability. Let's make another definition. Unfortunately, there are a lot of definitions today. It's gonna to be one of those days that's a sequence of definitions. And it's gonna be some results too. The next important definition is what a filtration is. A filtration on a probability space is a, this has nothing to do with Barnack spaces, by the way, this is just classic probability, is a monotone increasing 
sequence of sigma subalgebras, a n, so the sigma subalgebras of a by a sigma subalgebra, I mean, it's a subset of the sigma algebra and it is itself a sigma algebra. So by monotone increasing, I mean that a zero, I should say by the way that n is in the natural numbers and I include zero in the natural numbers. So you have a sigma subalgebra a zero contained in a one, contained in a two, contained in so on, so on, so on. And all of them are contained in the sigma algebra a that defines the probability space. I'm going to introduce some notation that I don't think is standard. Right, a sub dot, this, this is um, slash bullet in LaTeX. Um, we're going to use this notation to denote a sequence just because it's so much quicker. And then I don't have to write out the dummy variable n all the time. I'll call this bullet notation because like a bullet, it is faster. Also, it has this subscript bullet. Right, so what's a filtration? Filtration, as I said, is modeling the progression of information over time. So what I'm gonna come back to this again later, but you should think at time n, I have access to the sigma algebra a n, which isn't the full sigma algebra a. And the information that I have as time progresses, it maybe doesn't increase, but it certainly doesn't decrease. Except of course, if you have a really bad, you know, a bad lecture course, your information might decrease as time goes on, but this is a special case. I'll give an example. I'll give two examples of basic examples of filtrations that we use in applications. Take for example, the unit interval with the Borel sigma algebra and the Lebesgue measure. For all n in the natural numbers, let a n be the sigma algebra uh, generated by dyadic intervals of length two to the minus n. So these dyadic intervals all look like this. In, in notation, they look like this. Two to the minus nk, two, two to the minus nk plus one. For k from zero up to two to the n minus one. And I can never read these things. I have to look at pictures. If this is the unit interval, then a zero consists, well, a zero is the the trivial sigma algebra. It's got the empty set and the full set. A1 is generated by the, the two intervals of length one half, the two sub intervals of length one half. A2 is generated by the, the four dyadic intervals of length one quarter. So not only does it contain these intervals, but it also contains their unions, for example. That's what I mean by generated by, and so on. So A3 is generated by these eight intervals here and yeah and this is a filtration because you always have more sets in the next stage because in particular you can write to say this blue set here as the union of two sets in the other sigma algebra so this subset of a1 is contained in a2 and so on it's monotone increasing This filtration here is the, what we'll call a standard dyadic filtration. Um, I have a question, Alex. Yep. In this course, are we only gonna treat discrete time? Yes. Um, processes, okay. Yep, because continuous time ones are too complicated for me. Yeah, okay. Don't and we don't need one. them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, you know probability, so you know that most of what I'm going to say does generalize to continuous time, filtrations, processes, and so on, martingales, whatever, stochastic integrals. Yeah. yeah. We're not no, going to do that. It yeah. gets more complicated, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else do I want to say about this? If you have a random variable f on the unit interval valued in a Barnack space x, it is a n measurable if and only if it is 
constant on all dyadic intervals of length two to the minus n. So what this is sort of saying is if you look at a function which is a n measurable, it's got a certain degree of, um, of granularity. Is that the word I want to say? You can't really see the full definition of a function on the full unit interval. You can only see constants on each dyadic interval. So it's like you're sampling it at these intervals and just taking one sample for each one. That's the information you have at time n in some sense with respect to some sort of process. This filtration is very important in harmonic analysis. We're going to see it a lot in the um, analysis of singular integrals like the Hilbert transform later on. But for now, we're not really going to use it too much. Another related example, if you take a two point space, the space considering of consisting of plus minus one, two points, with its uniform probability measure. And this is Dirac mass at minus one plus Dirac mass at plus one divided by two, if you want to be very explicit. Probability of each of plus one equals probability of minus one equals one half. Yep. And you take the probability space omega to be the infinite product of these over the natural numbers. Well, you can write this as plus minus one to the natural numbers. You take its product sigma algebra and measure. If you don't remember how product sigma algebras and measures work, go grab out your measure theory textbook. It's in there somewhere. Or go grab your probability textbook. It's in there somewhere. The important thing is that when you take a product of probability spaces, you get a probability space. The measures don't somehow blow up. They stay one. Yeah. So if you're given a point in this space, say omega in capital omega, such a point is a sequence where the elements of the sequence are all plus or minus one. So it's a sequence of signs, basically a sequence of plus minus ones. Now for a natural number n, let's fix a vector eta going from zero up to n. And this is going to be a finite sequence of signs. So you take only n plus one signs instead of a whole sequence of them. And given such a vector, we define a set A sub eta to be the set of all sequences in our probability space, such that omega k is equal to eta k for all k from zero up to n. So this is all omega such that omega is taking the form e to zero, e to one, up to e to n, and then some other stuff's happening. So it's all the sequences which coincide with this vector eta at the beginning, and then they can be anything at the end. All the sequences starting with eta, he could say. And we define our sigma algebra a n to be the one generated by the sets A sub eta, where eta has n plus one elements. Now, how many sets are in A zero? A zero has got, if I've defined everything right, it should have one set, but maybe I've got it wrong and it's got two sets. My indexing is slightly wrong. So A0 has got two sets. The sequence is starting with zero, with one and the sequence is starting with minus one. And whenever you have a uh, an element eta, well, what do I want to say here? Whenever you have a set that's in this, a set of the form A eta, it splits into two sets of the form A eta prime where eta prime's got one more element than eta. So if you have a given eta, you've got two ways of completing it to a new vector with one more element. You can either add a plus one or add a minus one. So this is taking every set in this collection and subdividing it into two. 
So it's looking very much like the dyadic filtration in the previous example, where every generating set splits into two generating sets of the next filtration. And in fact, these are the same thing, actually. In, in disguise, these two structures are really the same thing, just with different parameterization in a sense. So this filtration A dot, A bullet, is what you call the coordinate filtration. For reasons we'll see later on. And a function F on omega is a n measurable if and only if f only depends on its first n plus one elements, on its first n plus one arguments, I should say. So f omega equals f of omega one, or omega zero, omega one, up to omega n. So if f doesn't see any of the, the variables with index greater than n, this is the same as being a n measurable. And this is basically like a function being constant on dyadic intervals of length two to the minus n. You don't really go deeper than the nth level. Uh, if this doesn't make sense to you now, it will make a bit more sense to you later on. So it's worth coming back to these examples later on. They're in the notes, by the way, you can study them there if this wasn't totally clear. Are there any questions about these examples? Okay. So let's go back to definitions. <laughs> We've got a couple of definitions, a couple of examples, a couple more definitions. So we take our probability space and our Barnack space. What are we defining? Uh, we're defining a stochastic process. I'm going to clarify that these are discrete time processes. Sorry, I can't. Right, discrete properly. A discrete time stochastic process x valued. Discrete time x valued stochastic process. Uh, for me at least, on omega, is a sequence fn. I'm indexing all of my stochastic processes by the natural numbers, but of course you can generalize this. A sequence of A measurable X valued random variables. So strongly measurable on Omega. And that's the definition. That's what a stochastic process is. It's just a bunch of random variables, just a sequence. We're going to write the same bullet notation, F sub bullet, for the process fn, n, in, n, just to save time. That's all a stochastic process is. There's nothing fancy there. Particular processes might have fancy properties, but a stochastic process is just a sequence of random variables indexed by time. The we have discrete time. So this interpretation of time is what's making the sequence fancy <laughs> in a sense. We define the different sequence of a stochastic process F is another stochastic process, which we call DF. And it's defined by this equation here, the nth the element of this stochastic process, dfn, is fn minus fn minus one for all natural numbers with the interpretation that f minus one is the constant, not the constant variable zero. So we have our sequence of random variables and we look at the difference between the two. And that's another stochastic process because the difference of two random variables is again a random variable. It's strongly measurable, that's all you need. Uh, other things we need to define, given a filtration, a bullet, a stochastic process F bullet is called, we have a few notions here, it's called adapted to the filtration. If each Fn is An measurable, 
So this is saying, you know, Fn at time n, if the filtration A represents the information you have at each time n. It's called predictable. This is with respect to A. If each Fn is A n minus one measurable, which is a stronger condition. So predictability is saying at time n minus one, you already know what Fn is. So adaptedness is saying at time n, you know Fn. Predictability is at time n, you know Fn plus one. You know a bit more. And of course we say that A minus one is the trivial sigma algebra with only the empty set and the whole set because we need in particular F zero to be a minus one measurable <laughs> if you have predictability. That's all of that definition. And now's the point where I need to re-emphasize again, a filtration represents information available at time n. And I've already said that a few times, but this is the point where it's actually written down in my notes. So I better tell you again. Um, I would have to give another example of a filtration, well, not of a filtration, of a stochastic process and filtrations associated with that and so on. Example. So let's take an X valued stochastic process. Stochastic process on some probability space omega. None of these things really matter. The filtration generated by F. So given a stochastic process, there's actually a natural filtration associated with that is to give it a name, let's call it a bullet. A n is a sigma algebra generated by the functions f0, f1, up to f n. This is standard notation for the sigma algebra generated by a bunch of functions. This is the, by definition, the smallest sigma algebra such that the functions, not random variables, I should say f0, f1, up to f n are measurable. So if you demand that these random vari variables are measurable, some other functions are also gonna be measurable as a consequence of that. This sigma algebra is the smallest one. So what does this mean in terms of information available in terms of this interpretation of filtrations that we have? This means that one knows F0, F1, et cetera, up to Fn at time n. And this is how we should think of a stochastic process. So at time n, we gain the nth function Fn and we don't lose the previous ones, like we keep them. So at time n, we know these, these first n plus one functions, F0 up to Fn. And we also know all functions of those functions that are deterministic, right? Like if you know the outcome of say, you're doing coin flips and you know the outcome of the first four coin flips. You also know the sum of the first four coin flips, right? This is obvious. How is this written mathematically? What's happening is for all measurable functions G, oops, not a ball G, this is not a vector valued function. For all measurable functions G from the target Barnack space X to the N plus one into some measurable space S So for all such measurable functions from basically the, the vector of outcomes we have in the first n trials, these are all x valued. We know g of f0, f1, etc., up to fn. So what I should say, what this is at a single omega is g of f0 omega up to fn omega. We know this function. This is mapping omega to S. We know it because it's the composition of, we know it at time n, it's the composition of functions that are an measurable with this product function, which is always gonna be measurable. And we compose that with G. 
which is measurable by assumption. So we know all functions of the first n variables, first n plus one variables, whatever. So what we know is all functions of f0 up to fn in this measurable sense. Does that make sense to people? People who are not probabilists? Is the converse also true? The converse Whenever is true. Whenever a function is measurable, we can write it that way? This is true, it's a theorem. And I'm not gonna do this theorem because we don't need it, but it is true. I forget who it's named after. Probabilists help me out here. Whose theorem is this? Uh, uh, Dube do it? I think it Dube. might be Dube, you're right. Yeah, yeah. I looked it up when I was preparing the notes and I thought, should I include no, no, it? And then I realized no, I'm not gonna. I don't know if it has a name, but I, I think I know what you're talking about. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, under fairly mild conditions, the converse is also true. A function is going to be measurable, is going to be measurable with respect to the smallest sigma algebra generated by a collection of functions, if and only if it is a function of those functions. Okay, thanks. Which is nice to know, but we don't need it. So we've got a couple of minutes before we should take a break. Let's quickly go back to the, the gambling. So go back to this game we started with and just explain all of the quantities there in terms of the language that we now have. So what we're modeling, we're modeling the game on the probability space omega, which is plus minus one to the n. Minus one represents tails, plus one represents heads. So we randomly choose an element of this probability space and that gives you the sequence of heads and tails out to infinity that your game consists of. For all natural numbers n, we let pi n be the nth coordinate map on omega. So pi n of omega is omega n. So pi n of omega is the nth outcome. Omega is the whole outcome, like all the whole sequence of coin flips. You think of God as flipping the coin and that coin consists of all of the coin flips. And pi n gives you the outcome of the nth coin flip. Uh, so what do I want to say? Pi n is a real valued, well, not pi n, I should say pi bullet. It's a real valued stochastic process. It generates a filtration and the filtration that it generates is the coordinate filtration. that I introduced earlier, where you took all vectors of length n, or length n plus one, and you looked at all of the, the omega that started with that vector. The filtration generated by these sets is the filtration generated by this process. You can check that. Um, so the process x bullet, which is giving the, the bet, bets at time n. You can think of these, of course, as a stochastic process as well. And these are allowed, well, xn may depend on pi zero, pi one, etc., up to pi n minus one. So what this is saying is that your bet at time n is allowed to depend on all the previous outcomes. So what this is saying in proper language is that the process x bullet is predictable with respect to a bullet because xn is measurable in the sigma algebra generated by pi zero up to pi n minus one and that's a n minus one. So, pi, uh, so x is predictable in our language. We have this function s bullet which was the state of the wallet. Uh, this is given by sn plus one equals Sn plus pi N plus one, Xn plus one. Pi N plus one is plus or minus one, depending on the outcome of the coin flip. S to the minus one is zero by definition. So by induction, Sn plus one is a N plus one measurable. Because Sn is by induction, a N measurable. Pi n plus one is a n plus one measurable. 
and xn plus one is a n measurable and a n is contained in a n plus one. So what this says is that S is adapted to A, but not predictable. It's not gonna be predictable unless you bet nothing every time, which is just not playing. And then the outcome is predictable. You can see the future if you don't bet. If you don't bet, you don't lose, right? You also don't win, that's okay. Yeah, so that's all I wanna say for now before the break. Any questions pre-break? Okay.